Yes, please. Yes, Godwin, I'm seeing Simon Ortegeka as part of the panelists. No, no, that's, are those are... Uh, uh, the attendees. Let me, let me talk to you offline. It's, the room is already open. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me inbox. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone on board. Can I be heard, panelists? Yes, I can hear you. How about Fred, Dr. Frederick, Fred Mwanga, we are welcome on board. Can you please hear me? Doctor. Doctor, are you, are you on board? I'm on board, uh, I'm listening and seeing also. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, now. <laughs> <laughs> so that is me, I'm there now. Okay, I'm glad to know you're listening. Ask the panel to love our videos on at least. Mm. Okay. Yes, we are. We are shortly going. I will have to introduce you people. 
Mm-hmm. And then, see, I say Makadi will join us maybe as as the webinar goes on. So, for the interest of time, we are going to begin as agreed at this time. For everyone who has joined in with us, thank you so much. I can see there are so many people coming in on board. For the participants, we are ready to begin. My name, the moderator, um, my name is Winter Slivia. I'm a partner at Achali Manzi and Company Advocates. It's located in Intinda. I mainly major in family law, divorce, and custody, and adoption, as much as I also do criminal law and land. I'm also a deputy, I'm also on the family law cluster as the deputy. As you can see, our flyer had another member, one of them being Joanita Bushara. Bushara is our chairperson who heads the family law cluster at Uganda Law Society. And today, being that the two executive members, she will not participate, she has left this with me. Mm. So I'll only have three panelists on board today. Introducing to you the panelists are, one of them will be Chiai Dorothy Esther. Esther is a protection officer at the National Coalition for Human Rights Defenders. She's also an advocate of the High Court of Uganda as well as a psychologist. Our other second panelist is Dr. Frederick Wanga, Fred Wanga. Fred Wanga is a senior lecturer at Makere University and also a laboratory director at BNA Clinical Labs. This one will be telling you, hope you got so much in line with the DNA implications and whatever has been going on since we last had this recently. Our third panelist with us will be Isaac Semakade, the, an advocate of the High Court of Uganda and founder Legal Brain Trust. Uh, I believe we all know who Semakadi is, as he will also be on board with us. For now, currently, allow me to introduce to you Dorothy Kiai Esther, who will be taking us through at least the, from the human race perspective, what is DA like? How, what is the effect of this, the DNA? especially in regard to the family and community. Dorothy, are you ready for to take us through that? The legal implications will be having them with the Isaac Semeka. You can take us through the human race perspective, at least in line with your work as a psychologist and how this is affecting the family and the community at large. Both pros and cons of the same. Thank you so much, Dorothy. You have 10 minutes with you and we'll be glad to listen in. Thank you so much, Winter. Once again, my name is Kiai Dorothy Esther. I'll, for purposes of the introduction, just have the, um, the video on, but I'll take it on as I continue. I'm a lawyer by profession. However, yeah. I took interest in psychology, uh, given my human rights background and part of very many human rights defenders and many issues of mental health. So I picked an interest and yeah, I'm pursuing that journey and I'm very excited. I'm very excited to give um, maybe the pros and cons on the, the issue of uh, the implications of DNA testing and um yeah, as I go to share, we'll be able, I'll be able to share the consequences, the impact, but also gaps and then recommendations. Then we'll give it up to our um, the participants to be able to ask us any questions in case there are areas they would like to know further. So let me quickly dive into, into the discussion. The decision to undergo DNA tests in this line, I would call it paternity test, is never an easy task. Uh, given even how society and media is presenting it, and it is surrounded, and this is because it's surrounded by controversies, questions, doubts, fears that come around it. And in this regard of DNA, DNA is wide, but what has caused controversy in our, in our society has been in line with the paternity test because DNA can be done on issues of uh, diagnosis, but a doctor will go in that area. I wouldn't want to go in that area. 
so because of the controversies and questions and doubts that surround it, it, it is that as the issue of DNA testing extends and spreads further into the population, it is important to consider what effect, and in this regard, I would say what psychological effect this will have on individuals and also society as, a, as, as, a large, as at large, because it's a very, given that we are Africans, we have our African culture, there's a lot of mystery around issues of DNA and how it was done previously and how it is done previously. And this has also shown that, um, research has shown that individuals who decide to go under DNA testing, hmm, yes. have have a, a first different, um, they go through a lot of mental, mental, mental challenges, let me say, because you're in fear of what will the results be, but also in the waiting, especially I, I'll take it on regard to the men, because usually when you talk about paternity, we are moving towards that, we are imagining the different scenarios in this regard that a man has a lot of doubts, a lot of questions in regard to the children that he is having in the home. So the whole process of, 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 of deciding to go and test, to test DNA of the children, but even the process of waiting, there is a lot of fear going on. There's a lot of anxiety, I must say, for this person, even waiting for the results, but even not knowing what will be their response and this is influenced by many, many factors. So what are those challenges? And I'm going to look at the impacts, the impact on three parties. I'm going to look at the person taking the paternity test. In this instance, I'm going to choose the, if it is a man, a man taking. What are the psychological effects? If it turned out positive, because anxiety is fear of the unknown, but even the unknown has an impact on even family. So there are some psychological imp implications or effects that happen. And in case the DNA test comes, the results turn out that the children are not for this person or child. People react differently. Some people get suicidal because in this instance, their whole life has been ripped of them. They've been cheated. They feel betrayed in that regard. So suicide. Is, is one of the things that someone that is depressed and is questioning and has all these, 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 these controversies going through the mind. Anger, depression, I'm looking at the person that has taken the paternity test, guilt. There's a lot of regret and there's a lot of disruption of relationships. So that has to be acknowledged in, in this regard. There is um, stigmatization. Because if you find that all the children are not, you know, you're labeled, there's a lot of labeling, but there's a lot of deceit and regret that this person faces in regard to the results because their suspicion has been com co confirmed. It induces feelings of rejection, low self-esteem, a confusion when it comes to what are the psychological effects or implications of the DNA testing. Like I said, the whole anxiety while you're going to do that test, waiting for the results and the after already has an e effect on the psychological well being. Now, let me take it to the children. And this depends on age, but we all want a sense of belonging. And if that is one of the groundings that is shattered, then someone's mind. Is, is taken aback and a lot of feelings, like I said, when it regards to children, identity, confusion for the child, there is rejection. In the media, we saw this gentleman come up and there was a young boy after the DNA test came out, it was found out that the son is not his. And we saw, I saw in the media, how he got the son and told him, you don't belong to this clan. Your mother will tell you where you, you do belong. From today henceforth, I rip you off this name. I rip you off this. This has a lot of psychological destruction, let me say, impacts on the child because they lose their sense of belonging. 
there is a lot of confusion. There's low self-esteem in regard to this. Um, there's shock, there's detachment. And it's under shock is at that point, everything is ripped off you. So some of these things manifest into someone getting suicidal, someone having a lot of void in, in that regard. And of course, the most controversial bit would be coming to the mother. You know, most of the time we don't think of the psychological impact, also the DNA testing has on the woman. First of all, they have been holding this, this um, information or secret and that means they've been living in a lot of anxiety and fear of what if they found out and not even knowing what will they do because some people are not mentally prepared for um, the actualization of this. But also they are human. They actually go through a lot of anxiety, confusion because they have not released certain information. Probably they are living a certain life of deceit and this also has a mental implication and thus affects the family as a whole because as a, a, a family, but also the relationship that is the, 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 the husband and spouse, but also the siblings. So it distorts a lot of sense of belonging. It distorts a lot of um, um, identity for the child in, in, this, in this regard. And uh, as part of my... Uh, and, and there's a lot of distress associated with DNA testing. Like I said, it is not an easy task for everyone um, to, to take on. By the time they have taken on, that means a lot of questions. And some of the things, it goes from just family, but it goes to society at large, family, friends. It has a very, very big psychological impact on the father that has taken the paternity test, on the child, but also the mother. The father is ripped off, off his life. The child is ripped off their life. The mother has to live with this shame as society has actually um, puts it because you have to live through all these things. And there is, it is important thus to have a lot of psychosocial support given. And my question would be, I don't know, doctor will guide us, are there, pre-psychosocial counseling services provided to people that seek to do the DNA testing. Who prepares, how are these people prepared? Because some of them come with signs, they are angry, they are shouting, they are panicking. Th those should be indicators of the, the post-test uh, post reaction of this person. And that means, um, the research is, we need to do some research to determine the most effective and practical counseling strategy for, 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 for the people that do go to do the DNA testing because they are definitely psychological impacts on the person going to take, but also the child, but even the mother herself. Whereas some women settle with it, but some are not prepared and ready for that. And there is need for expert counseling to guide the people on how to deal and how to react. And also for the children, how do you accept this new state? Because beyond just finding out the results, there are also instances where you have to deal. So there's need to have a lot of social support than the results themselves. So that is one of the things, psychosocial support, expert support, social support beyond just the DNA testing and the results that are in place because life goes on, people continue living with this. So therapy is very key in, 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 in ensuring. And a lot of assessments, um, that would be my recommendations, quite a number of assessments have to be done just beyond doing the DNA testing. This way it helps to prepare um, the people that are going to actually do the DNA testing, because we have the DNA testing that is um, legally accepted. But then there's this one that is just, it, it snaps up on you. Someone wakes up, they have their doubt, because uh, maybe the child is behaving differently. They just go and perform the DNA test, and they do not know what to, how to handle the results as okay. they have come. Dorothy, yes. you have three minutes. Please wind up. Yes. So 
the other thing that um, I think I've really emphasized the need to have a lot of professional, uh, psychosocial professional persons to support persons that are going to do the DNA testing, but to also support the children that are found in between here, but also educate the masses the importance of DNA and why then it happens. Because now it has come up and everyone seemingly is jumping on the bandwagon. And because we have such, we then need to have a lot of psychosocial support for the people that are having it, the families out there, that um, the relationships that are, are at stake when this is, is handled. Because some of these cases are going to be new. They are new in the arena. How do people handle other than just leaving it to, to media, handling it and people just having conversations. I think such platforms are good to start having and discussing what is the way forward because then people have been enlightened and are actually taking on these tests in that regard. So that is uh, basically what I have to share. And like I said, there are so many effects. We have suicide, anxiety, depression, anger, rejection, disrupted relationships, stigmatization. All these need to be handled because in the end, they do affect how people relate and the social standing of people in society, as a family, and as individuals. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dorothy. That was very elaborate, uh, especially getting us about the psychosocial effect of everyone involved. I like the fact that even also reminded us that the mother herself for being deceitful is also affected in how one way or the other, as much as this also affects the family at large, everything is broken. If we recall very well, the influx of this DNA started almost immediately after this one other businessman, was it the richest, one of the richest men in Uganda that we have, Michael Kasawali. That were known as Samona when he went to test and some of his children were not biologically his. I can assure you it's until then that I think almost every Ugandan is now lining up for DNA testing. And with us here, we are having our next panelist member sending in questions. They will, your queries will be answered after the panelists, at least we've had from all the panelists. We also like, I'm also announcing that we've been joined with our, by our fourth panelist, that's Isaac Semakadi. And Semakadi will be taking us through the law on DNA and the, any other recommendations, if you feel, if there are any and the lacuna, is, and as well as the lacuna in the law. Isaac Semakadi, thank you so much for joining us. We're happy to have you on board. So I'm um, introducing our second panelist, that is Dr. Fred Gwanga, the senior lecturer at Makere University and laboratory director BNA Clinical Labs. This is uh, one of the clinical labs where the widespread of DNA has been conducted and it's the, one of the most authentic ones we have in Uganda currently. We have two and DNA is one of the main one and the other government one. So doctor, before you come on board, kindly help us like, okay, take us through the two main questions that really are worrying everyone. What is DNA and why the paternity test itself? And if you'll be kind of enough, as long as it's not professionally, it's, it's professionally ethical, you may as well give us the statistics as of the last two months vis-a-vis -vis all the years Ugandans have been really asleep until today and how everything has been unfold, everything in regard to DNA testing has been unfolding. We are happy to have you on board. Please take on the comment. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, uh, thank you, Winter. Madam Winter. Um, but this side, it has been hot, not winter to today. <laughs> oh, um, <yes. laughs> I guess yeah. you allocating me like how many minutes 10 or 15 10? i'm giving you 12 12 okay thank you very much so you. Many. Hello. But I being that that I'm giving you 15 we really okay. have we need more knowledge for this yes as okay. well as in the professional let's know what doctors have on board okay thank you very much once again uh thank yes. you members who are listening and looking at my look at the first there um <laughs> I'm called Dr. Fred Boanga, and I've been introduced well by the, our chair today. 
Um, straight away, we'll go to DNA. DNA, I think you all know what DNA is, that complex word, deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, DNA is acquired at the time of fertilization. So when the sperm cell comes together with the egg cell, those two cells normally meet in the fallopian tube. You can simply say the, the womb, but actually the womb has those tubes coming from the ovaries to the actual womb. So the wedding of the sperm cell and the, and the egg cell occurs in some part of that fallopian tube. So when he, those two cells come together, basically at that moment, the sperm cell comes, comes with the DNA from the father and the, the egg cell comes with, with the DNA tape from the mother. So those two tapes come together and they form up the first cell. So then that cell goes on dividing into many others, which later specialize into the different body parts like the head, the ear, the nose, and so on. But as that goes on, as each cell gets a new daughter cell, the daughter cell goes with a copy of the DNA, of the DNA tape, which was in the mother cell. So by the nine months of birth, by nine months of pregnancy, sorry, a child is born when he, all the cells on that body are having the same DNA tapes, one having come from the father and the other from the mother. Now, when we do a DNA test for paternity, for example, mm. uh, we, we look at the, child, the cells in the child, we pick them and we look at the DNA in there. And then we see whether half of that DNA in those cells can be traceable in the father's DNA profile. Similarly, when we do a maternity, then we look at the child's DNA and we see if half of it is traceable in the mother's DNA profile. So if we can establish that it, it is traceable in either the father or the mother, then we can conclude on biological paternity or biological maternity. So basically that is the science of DNA testing. The rest are procedures really. Now, okay. yeah. uh, you know, each of us has DNA. So DNA is found in all living things, in the humans, in the gods, in cows, and even trees and so on. Everything has DNA, bacteria, viruses, and so on and so forth. So every living thing has DNA, and that DNA works as the type of life, and all the information that we manifest out on a personal note, that thing, that living thing, its blueprint is in the DNA molecule. So you find someone is tall, the, the other one is short, another one has a big nose, another one is smaller one, another one is light skinned, another one is darker skinned like me. All that information is in the what? In the DNA but it will present at various times as we grow up. Like some genes will be switched on during a puberty and then people change to look dif different a bit. So that is, the information is there in the DNA, but it will manifest at different times. Um, so I think since each of us has DNA, it is just nice that we, what we actually, the population has been very excited about DNA, but, uh, in the next five minutes, I would like to clarify a bit on, on actually why people do DNA testing. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> they made, there are about seven reasons, but I'm, I've grouped them in two pieces of mind, uh, legal immigration, DNA profiling, uh, DNA relationship, Y chromosome testing, um, forensic DNA testing and medical DNA testing. But if looking at the peace of mind, uh, this is a, a DNA test which is done mainly to assist those children who are invisible. I think everyone has been talking about the family, even our current uh, previous presenter, the one who came before me, that lady called she, she, yeah, is it she, Dorothy? Dorothy. Everyone is talking about the family, the family. And everyone has forgotten that most of the children born nowadays are not born in what? In families. Many children are born outside families. 
And even us who are here or listening or watching, probably we have children who are born outside families. And those families, those children, I would prefer to call them invisible children. The plight of those children is, is invisible. So those children are the ones who the DNA test has hoped most to place them into some home where the father maybe is, but dying before. Also, or maybe the father died, but the grandparents are there, or uncles and so on. So that kind of DNA is the one which is commonly done. So a man is there and then a lady emerges and says, ah, this child is for you. And then the man is not sure uh, if he's sensitive enough, he will quietly go and do his DNA like the way many people want to solve their family issues or family related issues. And then if they know this is the, if they know this is their child, they take care of the child. But then there are those men who refuse. Those will end up into the law enforcement in child and family police and so on. So I would like to appeal to everyone listening to understand that the person who is benefiting most from this DNA test is that child whose paternity is in, in question. And sometimes the mother herself is not sure of who the biological father of this child is. Yesterday I was presenting to some group and I told them that there's a mother who has so far brought five children and none of those five has come out as the biological father of the, the, the child. So sometimes the mothers are not aware and the child is demanding to know the dad. <laughs> Sometimes it is relatives who are demanding to know, or, or they have a room has come up and the ladies who are listening, you know very well how this can affect you in the, in the marriage if you are there. And then they say, ah, that child is not for our son. And you know how much rough time you will have in that family. So sometimes the mother is doubting whether the hospital gave her the right baby or not. So those ones are also there, but a lot of the times they are not correct. We normally find the mother is actually the biological mother of that particular child. In all those we test under that category, um, we find that actually about 60 to 70%, the father turns out as the biological father. And so those children will have a belonging somewhere. They will now, at least they will know, okay, I'm with my mom. But my father lives in, in the other village, and it is my father. I know now. The, the mother knows, and the child maybe will begin to know. So those are the people who have benefited primarily from DNA testing. The other 30 to 40 percent, where we find the, the father, the biological, I mean, the tested father is not the biological father. When we speak with the mothers, they are able to identify the other person who is the possible biological father. And in case that one is tested, then that also may turn out as the biological father. So by one man not being a biological father of a child, it doesn't mean there's no biological father of that child. And we heard that every child has the right to know um, his or her biological parents. Well, uh, the other That's reason... People do DNA testing is for legal use, like maybe for some reason there is a legal request to do a DNA like Administrator General can request the law enforcement child and family, the probation officers, when there is a dispute. Now, back at the peace of mind, where families have been involved in DNA testing, it has been the tiniest percentage. And I can tell you that the families who are in this meeting today, especially the men, since the patent has been the controversial. I think many of us, including myself, have not tested our children for DNA because we have not seen any need. But the families where a DNA test is ordered for a child in the family or is requested by the parent, there is normally a conflict that is going on in that family that requires a DNA result to, so, to, so, to bring the evidence on the table in order for the conflict to be resolved. And Doctor, is, yes? 
You're left with around three added minutes, please. Yes, I, I, I know that fiber will be breaking off. And mm. if those, those what, those children, I mean, those family members, then a few of them, either a third party post the information in the social media, or sometimes themselves, but that's quite rare. Whenever we try to follow up those few you have seen, anyway, at MGN Lab, we have been testing for DNA right here in Uganda since 2012. And surely if there were many issues we would have heard about them before. So this recent media hype or social media hype has been really most, mostly has not been correct because the biggest group we test is that group with the, the children with, with the non-clear eye, what paternity? that has made the bulk, not families. And the, um, to give you an example, in Luero, where the bishop has, has tried to become the bishop of that uh, diocese, that gentleman has a family. But now the child who is in the dispute, who is the pattern, is that other child whom you have read about in the news or seen on the TV. And therefore, I highlight that when the DNA test is going to be done, probably it's going to be done for that child and not for the children the bishop has at home, as in like his major family there. So I want members to appreciate that there's that group of children who are now I'm representing with that bishop's child in courts, who are invisible and whom none of us wants to talk about. We're always talking about family, family, but we have forgotten the bulk of those children um, as I conclude in the last minute, the other reason is people do DNA testing is for immigration. I had one of you is an immigration lawyer. Like uh, people go to sign a baby's home and claim, ah, this child is mine. I want to go with him. I want to own up back my child. Oh, I want to go with him to America, that kind of thing. A lot of times we find that actually those people just want to do child trafficking. So by putting this condition, then that offense is minimized. Then profiling, DNA profiling, this was just any man can walk in and they have their profile and the, the profile is kept at home with the wife or the family lawyer, whatever, friends. In the event of death, it is very common for ladies to come from nowhere and they say this child or these children also were for the red. So before even bury your happiness, if this profile is there already, it is easy for the newcomer children to be tested and then we confirm paternity or no. And they can send the right to belong to that family because they, their father, if he's the one, is dead. So unless there is now that confirmation, there is no, no. Uh, then in Y chromosome, this is for letting males, male like paternal uncle to nephew, like grandson to grandfather, brother to brother. Then in forensic science, you saw what happened in Kasese, in Budo Junior, where those bodies were burnt beyond the population. They were all identified with that DNA. Last year on the medical, we also use DNA technology to test body organ recipients versus potential donors. There are some genes we use, we test in the DNA step, which will tell us that the donor can match with the recipient. And so the organ will not be rejected in case one gives the other the kidney. That's also a very common DNA test we do here, here at MBN. And it has helped many people to get organs and they go out and get organs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. That was well detailed and insightful information, especially where you are really guiding us on the peace of mind and more like in summary, DNA is to give identity and we are realizing it's giving identity more like to the children outside the family and all identity both to the man and the child in question. So at the end of the day, probably each of us needs to do a DNA to find our own belonging. Thank you. So. People with questions will be as I'll give time after the last discussant and we will be dividing the queries that have been given to us and then you'll be responded to. But nonetheless, we still will come more questions in. 
So we are going to our last discussant. Unfortunately, we have limited time, but we are happy to have with us Council, whatever Senior Council Isaac Semakade, who will be taking us through especially the lacuna of the law in regard to this DNA paternity testing and any recommendations if possible. Do we have regulations in Uganda and what exactly is missing? What do we need as advocates? How do we step up in order to correct any anomaly coming up because of DNA, the effects of DNA? Isaac, thank you so much. You're welcome on board. Please take the floor. Thank you very much, my dear sister. Um, please confirm whether I'm audible. You are audible, very, very audible, Isaac. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, uh, straight off the bat, I need to clarify that uh, there is no lacuna around DNA. Mm. Um, despite the hubbub and hulabaru in the media recently, uh, DNA, as the doctor has ably um, clarified, is personal, private, intimate information of the highest order. And so it attracts the highest constitutional protection under Article 27 on the right to privacy. As my uh, earlier sister also clarified, the exposure of DNA results has far-reaching implications that also attract protection um, under Article 24, the right to dignity and self-worth. Um, I mean, if it has uh, psychologically shattering effects, then there's a, a constitutional duty on all persons and authorities to minimize that harm under Article 24 uh, of the Constitution. Um, DNA is also a scientific tool, and therefore it is protected under Article 15 of the International Covenant for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the, the, which imposes on state parties an obligation to, to permit their citizens to benefit from scientific progress. Um, however, that is militated against by, you know, um, culture and uh, economic and political conditions of each and every country. Uh, what do I mean by this? DNA, the doctor may not have told you, has a very scientifically problematic background. Um, um, those of you who are familiar with uh, the topic known as eugenics or the scientific obsession for purity of a race or a people which uh, consumed a great you know, amount of time and resources for the uh, Hitler's Nazi regime. They are the ones who really um, sort of discovered DNA, uh, although the motivations were dubious. I mean, to create a super race, alien race, and sort of divide people um, into us and them in very destructive ways. Um, so whereas it's a pos does positives that the doctor has talked about, you must understand that taken to its absurd exploitation, it is a very, 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 very dangerous tool uh, in the hands of government. I have had people call for a compulsory harvesting of DNA at birth, meaning that they are unwittingly giving, <laughs> creating a government <laughs> database. Government, I don't even know that government has the resources to capture this database, uh, but yeah, unwittingly creating these floating databases of DNA out there without knowing the problematic history of this and without knowing the ripple effect of creating a, 
DNA silos across the country and how this can be dangerous for many, 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 many reasons, many nefarious reasons. So I, I want to go further and say that in 2019, Uganda legislated an act on data protection and privacy. It is called the Data Protection and Privacy Act of 2019. It is an act to give effects to Article 27, Sub-Article 2 of the Constitution, which provides for the protection of citizens' right to privacy. Uh, the objective of the act is to protect the privacy of individuals by regulating the collection and processing of personal information in Uganda and outside Uganda. If the information relates to Ugandan citizens to provide for the rights of all persons whose data is collected and the obligations of data collectors, data processors, data controllers. I guess that includes MBN laboratories and all the others that have been in the business of harvesting DNA for whatever lawful or curious purposes they have been engaged in, as well as to regulate the use and disclosure of personal information. The act gives individuals whose personal information has been requested, collected, collated, processed, or stored, uh, known as these persons are known as data subjects. And I guess here we mean mostly the kids, the children you're talking about of whatever age, powers to exercise control over their personal data, including consent to the collection and processing or to request the correction and deletion of personal data. So what is our beef with MBN laboratories? What is our beef with the government analytical laboratory? Um, at one degree, what is our beef with the courts of law in Uganda? What is our beef with the authorities? You know, he has mentioned immigration, police, and so on, and others. It, 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 it derives from their negation of the existence of this law. On this space, I had refused to participate unless the National Data Protection Officer, a lawyer called Stella Alibatese participates. Her silence and the silence of her office during this whole DNA storm is suspicious. I suspect that she has personally violated DNA and she is psychologically <laughs> disturbed because she can't come out openly to defend the autonomy and the you know, the essence of her office because she has a, a conflict of interest. Nothing else can help me understand exactly why she's silent and why she has refused her office from entering the foray of public discussion. Everybody has dipped a toe in this conversation except her office. So that begs many questions. Um, I will return to that later. Um, other important pieces of law, of course, are part nine of the Children's Act, section 67, 68 on parentage, who can apply for parentage and how are parentage disputes to be resolved. The doctor spoke very well about that. Uh, Madame Kiai spoke also briefly about this, but uh, everything, the most misunderstood part of both the Children's Act is section three. People tend to forget it, or the chapter, I think, and the schedule on welfare of the child in all decisions which are, must be specific to the circumstance of the particular child, the welfare of that child is the, is the paramount principle. I agree with the, the land doctor when he says that, uh, in my own words, I'll paraphrase it as this, uh, DNA is welcome if the goal is to use it as a shield to include children into care and protection. Um, of uh, an established family. It is unwelcome, it is dangerous, and it is unlawful and unjustified if it is to, intended to be used as a sword mm. to exclude a child uh, from tender loving care and protection uh, in the context of an established family setting. Um, the doctor has spoken about the what he has termed as invisible children. 
um, I don't want to repeat him, but I just want to say this, that uh, in the literature around this question, there is what we call curiosity tests. And again, our beef with most of the laboratories is that since they have offered DNA as an unregulated product over the counter, they have been permitting people to conduct curiosity tests. The right to know has limitations as well. A lot of lies are essential to our living. You know, infidelity, for instance, is not a cause to, you know, seek to know everything about everything. It's not how life really is. Truth is important, but truth must be, uh, it must be tempered with other valuable values like justice, like mercy, and uh, cultural bonds, and so on. Many other things beat truth as a value. Uh, um, as you grow old, you get to understand this. Um, I, I made uh, the case before with some of my friends that uh, how many of you seek to know the truth about everything before you make decisions? It's not really how we live, you know? Um, so this uh, fetishization of truth around this question is, is, is it, it, it arises from a certain narcissism, I guess, uh, where people want to center everything about me, 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 without thinking about the repercussions on others. Um, the last piece of law that I should mention is called the Evidence Act. Yes, um, Isaac, you have at least four, four minutes left. Oh, I will use less. The last piece of, 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 uh, of law here is the Evidence Act. Um, there are several decisions which are, are massively are coming out of the courts in the global south, including our neighbors, Kenya, Tanzania, India, and everywhere, where DNA is being rejected as a, as a magic magic bullet, uh, the law. Mm. Yes, hello? Yeah, we don't have to prove everything with DNA, especially in civil law settings. So I hope uh, those on the call can understand the, con the, dis the difference between civil and criminal law settings. Whereas DNA may be welcome in the, uh, welcome in the forensic sense of determining uh, liability for crime or, or protecting people against liability for crime, um, it is unwelcome in civil law settings where other tools uh, in the Evidence Act are valuable. For instance, there's a tool known as Estopo, Section 114. If, a, if Amos has, has lived with baby Bobby and treated baby Bobby as his or as his daughter for a considerable reason of time. There should be no um, argument that should unseat and tear apart this bond, uh, even if it's the solid truth. So, because the best interest of a child may not be in uh, destabilizing this established bond or for something entirely new. Um, so that's one of the tools I wanna bring out. Um, the other is uh, section 113 of the Evidence Act, the court may presume existence of certain facts the court may presume the existence of any fact which it thinks likely to have happened, regard having, regard being hard to the common cause of natural events, uh, human conduct and public and private business uh, in their relation to the facts of the particular case. I don't want to open this up, maybe open it up later, but it's the law. The court is entitled to make uh, value judgments upon sufficient facts. So we don't always need, for instance, DNA results to prove um, 
Is it infidelity or adultery? No. Um, uh, we can still use the established uh, procedures we used before DNA. Uh, uh, Section 112 of the Evidence Act, birth during marriage is conclusive proof of legitimacy. The fact that any person who was born during the continuous of a varied marriage mm -hmm. between his mother and any man or within 280 days after its dissolution, the mother being unmarried, it shall be conclusive proof that he is the legitimate son of that man unless it can be shown that the parties to that marriage had no access to each other at any time when he could have been begotten. So these are provisions which really predate this whole DNA fetish. Uh, but you can see that uh, uh, the law had intended really to be as less intrusive um, as possible in resolving uh, civil disputes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Semakaji, for that insightful legal knowledge in regard to DNA. However, before you leave, Probably you could help us answer this last question from one of the participants online. Uh, Douglas Matthew is asking, can court move to ask for a DNA test from parties in an application for parenthood if not contested by the parties? But if it's not contested, why would they apply, be applying for the parentage then? I don't know. Well, um, is, yes. I... I we are we are putting together a yes. compendium of cases um, mm. concerning parentage and DNA. Yes. Um, and uh, what we realize in all these cases is that uh, um, family courts are, are, are exercising restraint in making DNA orders uh, on okay. a case by case basis. So the past, the past, the past attitude of being uh, pro DNA is is, mm -hmm. is 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 falling out of favor. Okay? Uh, okay, as much as possible, courts are offering to hear as many exceptions um, to DNA as possible. By the way, consent is one of them. Uh, I want to stress something on this. There is a missing gap in our in our legal practice, in our civil practice around family court. When, when a DNA question comes up, you must understand that uh, we have now three people, a mother, an alleged mother, an alleged father, and, uh, and the child. The child. Now, yeah, their interests are in that case uh, are in conflict. You understand? So yeah. the consent of either of those parents is insufficient. What does the law then require in these circumstances? There is an old tool in the law called guardian ad litem. I think you're familiar with it. Yes, that please. The court yeah. must appoint as another person yeah. specifically to act in the best interest of a child as against those with whom the child's interests are in conflict. So in many of the proceedings I have seen and heard of in the family court where parentage orders or DNA orders have been made, they, they have been illegal because the court did not appoint a guardian ad litem to help articulate uh, the case for all against DNA for that particular child. The court took it that, for instance, it was, it had the autonomy to issue, you know, to evade consent for the child. All, all mm -hmm. either of the parents was enough. That's not true. So this is a very contentious issue. Uh, and uh, now that we have a specific law, which has clarified the, the, the breadth and depth and height and shape and content and quality of consent, there should be no excuse why family and uh, family courts and children's courts don't appoint guardians ad litem to argue the consent provisions of the Data Protection and Previous Act, as well as the emerging the, uh, um, jurisprudence. So it is not always the rule that uh, just because we are dealing with a, past, a parentage dispute, DNA is automatic and absolute. Okay. Thank you so much, Isaac, for the insight. 
Dorothy, please let me have your board for two minutes as well with your closing remarks. And then I'll have Dr. Lastly for the last remaining minutes because there are some other questions that doctor that doctor is would be well versed to answer, especially in regard to DNA testing. Yes, Dorothy. Dorothy, are you there? Yes, Winter. Um... We have two minutes at least to give your closing remarks as well yes. as any other addition. Mm. All right. Um, I'm just going to say that there is need to 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 provide psychosocial support. And the yes. three factors that we talked about that is the child, mm. the father, and the mother. At the mm. end of the day, um, they need to cope in mm. this. Yeah, the research also has to be um, is needed to determine the most effective and practical counseling strategies. Yes. To, to enable people know what options are there in case I found myself in this uh, 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 position. But also to know and to educate the masses. I think for me, this is very critical that people are aware of um, what exactly DNA testing is, what are the results of DNA testing, what are the impacts of the DNA testing. But being that um, as Ugandans, um, these are issues that will always affect our mental health. Therapy, therapy is so key. Seeing a, a clinical psychologist going for psychosocial support is very key, even when you're making this decision, because it helps you during the pre, during, and the post effects of the DNA testing. But knowledge is power. It is good to have these discussions and have support systems in place to be able to know what are the challenges that come around this and how can people cope in regard to um, this. And the amount of social support and psychological resources that people have also affect their ability to cope. So also mm. food ability is there in that uh, regard. Those are my oh. few remarks in that. All right. Thank you, Dorothy, yeah. thank you very much. Oh, oh, that was very good. Doctor. Are you there? Dr. Fred? I'm, I'm here, I'm here, I'm listening. Yes, please. One of the main question is how reliable are the results? Is it re not right to conduct a second one? I don't know what you have to answer in regard to that. Please, as a, someone is also asking, what is the purpose of the X chromosome? Whatever it is, kindly take us through as we also wind up and we close our show. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, how reliable? Um, okay, in laboratories which have a comprehensive quality assurance system, yes. like MDN Lab, mm -hmm. and that are international accredited, there are systems in place to check back and forth to ensure that the result that comes out is absolutely accurate. So the question of reliability only comes up if comes up if the systems are, have a fault somewhere, right from the time the sample is picked from the person being tested. The system must be able to capture all the possible problems on the way which could cause an, an unreliable result. So that's, that's what distinguishes an accredited laboratory from a non-accredited laboratory. Okay, thank you. Um, the purpose of X chromosome, X chromosome is the, is the normal chromosome which women carry X, X and men carry XY. So men have a share of the women's chromosome also, but women don't have a share of the men's Y chromosome. So men are a little bit selfish in that respect. But generally, chromosomes are just tufts of DNA. Like just imagine a rope which you use to tie cows. That's just a tape of DNA. Those are just it's like a, a rope of DNA is a chromosome. That's how we should understand it, with different information for different purposes. Um, as I close, sexual support yeah. is critical. And actually, that's why in the last 10 years, probably <laughs> many people did not know that DNA was going on, but testing was going on, but it has been going on. And yeah. people are supported the psychosocial and so on. But uh, well, I think the time came when it had to come out into the media like that. 
okay. and, and lastly, on um, Council Semakada has raised very good points there. What I just wanted to alert everyone here is that the cases of paternity that end up, parentage that end up in the courts of law are probably less than 5% of the entire problem in society. And, <laughs> and so, as we are talking, you know, I think when you, now when you're a lawyer, you think about the law and the courts. When you're a doctor, you think about the patients and the hospitals and so on. So this is normal for us. But if we are to tag DNA testing to, to orders from say courts or what, I think next time, Winter, you bring someone from the Child and Family Protection Police, I think they will be better in articulating this particular point, how they have hoped people, children get into their families without necessarily waiting for the courts to decide. Thank you very mm. much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Unfortunately, we had very short time for you, but we hope next time we'll have more time for you to answer more of these pending issues from our participants. Lastly, as we close, Sema Kadi, please give our, your closing remarks to the participants and then we'll be ending this webinar as of this evening. Isaac, are you there? Isaac? Yeah, I think my closing remarks, um, I'm yes. urging, um, I'm, I would like to use this platform to make the resounding claim that it has been a gross embarrassment for the office of the data protection officer headed by advocate Stella Rivatese to ignore this uh, topic and to ignore the duty, statutory duty she has to provide guidance to data mm -hmm. subjects and data pro collectors, processors, store, uh, storers, and so on and so forth, yeah. Okay, that is very kind of you. Thank you. I hope they are listening in. Participants on board, we've been very lucky to have you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being engaging. Panelists, thank you so much for committing this time to be with us. We are closing the show and we are very grateful that you've listened in and participated with us. Thank you. Have a good evening. <sighs> Hello?